I need some traction. You need some traction. First, quickly say it's uh, wonderful to be in such a beautiful city and also such a fantastic place for software companies. So my talk is about getting from signed up to satisfied. But to give you a little background, uh, I've recently moved into marketing at Intercom. I was originally involved a lot in the product. And in fact, if you've heard of anything we've done or published before, it was probably from the product side of things. Um, moving to marketing has been interesting for us. Intercom wasn't actually our first business. It was actually our third or fourth, depending on how you like to count. But what I have noticed, so I've been working with my co-founders since 2007, 2008, is that the, the nature of traction itself has changed quite a bit in that period. So way back you know, when we were trying to grow our first company, which is called Exceptional, uh, Ruby on Rails Error Tracker, all we ever stressed about was the funnel. And it was just this persistent fight with the idea of how can we get more shit into the funnel? It was all we cared about. And, uh, and the idea was that somehow if we did enough of that, we'd get rich, right? Uh, didn't happen, but we tried. Um, and like, <clears throat> through, like, you know, through a constant series of failure and disappointment, we kind of realized that there is, there is no one true way. There's actually a load of ways, and they all add up together to matter. Um, but I, you know, we kind of we gave up chasing like, these like, mythical, you know, grow your website with this one weird trick. We kind of <laughs> quickly realized there was no one weird trick. There was like, lots of tricks, and they weren't that weird. They, were, they just looked like hard work. So. Um, over time, as an industry, we kind of realized that, like, OK, there, there is no magical one way to like, become a billionaire overnight. Uh, what you do is you do a lot of work, and hopefully people will hear of you eventually. And then you get them to your website. And our next challenge then was, well, what the hell happens when they land on our website? Is this the right website? What could we do about that? Can we somehow like, get them to definitely sign up? And we developed all these tips and tricks that would like, sort of help us uh, if you like, optimize what happens when they land. And most specifically, we came up with this, well, not we, like the industry came up with this beautiful idea of A-B testing. And this was around 2010 or so when like Optimizely had kicked off. And it basically became, it became like the standard fare for everyone who had any degree of traffic whatsoever to find out uh, what the best possible way you could lay your page out, which was a positive thing. Um, it is fair to say that we learned a lot of good stuff. We also learned a lot of stuff we could have worked out otherwise. Big calls to action outperform small ones. Uh, calls to action in the right location outperform ones in the wrong location. Calls to action that are visible outperform those that are not visible. We, uh, you know, and uh, you know, you'd like to think we'd learn these things once, but as an industry, every like three weeks, I know it's like we just found out we increased our call, you know, our conversions by forty percent by making our call to action visible on the home screen. And I'm like, good job, guys. You know, <laughs> we'll get there. Uh, so, so. I think like, you know, every sort of, uh, as we've tried to tackle traction at each sort of step, we found ourselves uh, chasing these like silver bullets. We spent a lot of time searching for one of these when, to sort of paraphrase Ben Horowitz, it's actually a shitload of these is what we need, uh, i.e. real effective things, not mythical one weird tricks. So if there's no shortcuts in the top of the funnel, it just looks like hard work. And there's no one certain way to design a landing page. It just looks like great design, preferably with a good product to back it up. Uh, distribution kind of has become, it, it's changed in nature uh, because of these realizations. And then to bring us up to, say, early 2014, uh, you might be familiar with the site Product Hunt. Hands up who's heard of Product Hunt. Exactly, right? And, uh, and every, like, Product Hunt is like crack cocaine for people who are into web, right? Like, you just go there every day, and it's like, there's more shit to check out. And like, that's what you do. You just check it out. Like it's, it is effectively the app store for the web, but it's weirdly even more addictive. And, uh, and as a result, again, distribution got easier and easier and easier. So we, we found ourselves in a world where, like, you know, say a product like Yo, which some of you might remember, it was a product that let you send Yo's to people. Uh, <laughs> literally, that's what it was. That wasn't even a punchline, but whatever. <laughs> um, uh, Yo got a million users in four days, right? Which is insanity. Meerkat had 2 million users. Whisper, I think, had like tens of millions, uh, uh, sorry, Secret had tens of millions of users. Whisper has 20 million users. Peach, which I'm not, you know, I'm not sure how many of you remember this one because it was a real fly-by-night, but Peach is basically a, a product named after an emoticon or, or like an emoji, and uh, it lets you send, I guess, emojis and your battery status to other people. Uh, yeah. Um, 
But like, again, it, it hit massive traction really quickly. And what you kind of realize is today there are dozens of ways to get your first 100, your first 1,000, your first 10,000, or even your first million users. So much so that like Benedict Evans of Andreessen said recently, like, a cool new messaging app getting to 1 million users is actually just the new norm. Keeping them and getting to 100 mil is actually the question. And that's where we sort of found ourselves, that this idea that, like, that it's not just about getting everyone to hit your website. There's actually something deeper going on that actually matters a lot more. And that whole idea is this concept of retention, uh, which we heard about earlier. And for me, like, this is what I sort of characterize as being like, you know, the next frontier. So we've gone from like, how the hell can we get people to hear about us to how the hell can we get them to sign up when they land on our page to this idea of how the hell can we get them to stick around if they ever do that. And that, to me, is like the next funnel, right? It's, we understand the past, but today I'm just going to talk through some ideas for the, the actual the, the second funnel, if you like. If you want hype, bullshit, and press, you can hack the hell out of the first funnel. If you want to build a billion dollar business, you need to solve the second one. And to give you a simple example, which of these two would you rather? And it's really important to think about this. If I give you one of these two options, right, and you can pick one, there's a big, big difference. You can have a million users or a million signups in four days, and most startup people get so hell bent on that idea that they literally think they've made it. Or you can have a million active users after 16 months. The first business is Yo. Yo is gone. The second business is Slack. I don't need to tell you what Slack are doing. So the question then becomes <clears throat> how do we get from sign up to success? Intercom has grown pretty much like a weed since, uh, since I've been involved, which is the, you know, August 15, 2011, our incorporation date. And uh, it's, you know, I'm sorry, the access just got caught here. I can't possibly show you our sensitive inf information. But it's been, a, it's been interesting to sort of think about uh, what, what we've kind of done right and what we've done wrong. I, you know, I don't look at Intercom and think that we nailed marketing or that we nailed comms or media relationships or virality or whatever. I think, and I, you know, I, I think there's some things we got right, and it just hasn't been about filling top of funnel necessarily. What we've kind of realized early on is that you can have all the tactics in the world, but if they hit your homepage, your homepage is bad, it'll go to shit. If they sign up and they, you don't have them doing anything useful after that, it'll go to shit. If they go through onboarding and your onboarding sucks, it'll go to shit. And if you get it all right, they'll become a happy customer, at which point your new obsession becomes keeping them, because if you don't keep them, they'll either leave or go to another customer, which means, again, it'll go to shit. If there's one point you should take from this, it's that you have to work very, very hard to stop it all going to shit, right? <laughs> so onboarding is, in a sense, the new conversion. It's the new thing we need to think about. And the question you have to ask is, what makes for a successful onboarding? Because, you know, and it's, it's funny how people allocate their time, resources, and, and capital because you'll spend, like, I have so many businesses who will tell me things like, you know, our, our, our CAC is $10, and I'm like, okay, or sorry, a cost per lead is $10. I'm like, so you're spending $10 to get a lead. Would you consider spending maybe two cents to increase the chance that that lead becomes a customer? And they're like, oof, that sounds expensive. And I'm like, but you're like literally pouring money into a leaky bucket otherwise. So onboarding is actually the channel, challenge of, like, how do we get people through from being, what the hell is this product, true to out to the other side, is saying, holy shit, this is quite a product. And when most people think about onboarding, they think of this idea here. They think of like, you know, uh, just it's the bit where we try to get the email. But there's a lot going on with onboarding, genuinely. Is it the idea of trying it out? Is it buying and paying? Is it being set up for success? Or is it like progressively expanding over time and learning about new changes? There is a lot to it. Now, the biggest thing I find myself beating into the heads of either startups who I chat with or, uh, or like, you know, new folks who start an intercom is this idea that you know, if you're doing things right, you're going to ship a lot. And if you're doing things really right, you're going to ship all the damn time, which means your product is constantly in flux. It is nothing short of a moving target. And every time your product changes, your definition of success for a customer has to change too. Which means that every time you roll out anything substantial on your product, you need to reconsider what should a successful user look like when they land on your page. What are the things you want them to do in what order and how? And you know, I, I'm, sort of, I'm almost worn out saying this, but like signing up for your app is literally the only thing that everyone does. 
You can tell me, oh, we're going to nail our new calendar feature or export to Dropbox or anything. And I'm like, yeah, yeah, maybe if you're doing things really well, 30, 40% of your customer base will use that. Have you looked at this thing that literally everyone does? Like, no, not in a while. Because most product owners sign up for the product once. And this is the problem. And when they signed up, it looked like this, right? They were literally granting themselves access to the product in a database somewhere, right? It's not the same thing as the funnel that, you're, that your customers, that you're asking and paying for your customers to go through. And the reason this all sucks is because if you don't continuously re reimagine what it's like to land on and start using your product, all this stuff goes out of date. Your product tour is out of date, your help docs are out of date, your welcome email is out of date. All that sort of stuff will go wrong. Which means that a neglected onboarding is actually net negative over time. You're literally pointing people to yesterday's ideas of your product not today's, which means you're literally pitching them on the wrong shit when they decide to use your product. And meanwhile, you have a product team working on some awesome stuff that they're never going to bump into. And yeah, you're going to say something like, well, Des, we're, you know, we're dog fooding. That's what we're doing. We use our product all the time. And I'm like, yes, that is true. You should dog food. You should use your product. But if you're literally feeding your dog, you actually open that tin every day. You don't just sit in the middle of a load of dog food. And that's the literal difference that people get wrong, right? Never stop signing up for your product, ever. It should be someone's job in your company to sign up for your product every week and make sure that, the, that like, everything still works well and makes sense. The current generation of billion-dollar businesses are obsessed about onboarding. You see companies like, say, Slack, where they built this incredible Slack bot, which basically does two things in parallel. It talks to you and teaches you how to use the product while collecting all the information, and then it suggests things that you should do next, and it works. Stripe, you could argue, their entire product was simply a much better onboarding for payments. They made it incredibly easy to start getting paid. And they did that through onboarding. They're actually famous for a thing called the Collison install, which is that in the early, early days, 2011, if you bumped into one of these people, uh, John or Patrick Collison, they would literally be like, oh, you want to use Stripe? Give me your laptop. And they'd actually do it for you. That was how serious they took onboarding. Now, you can't onboard everyone. And it's a mistake to try, because you'll end up bending your product around everyone. The way I think about onboarding these days is you, you can only onboard people who have a need, a desire, and a capability. So, no two of these three are enough. If they need it and desire it, but they don't have the authorization to purchase, or they, can't, uh, they don't have the skills to like, install or whatever, then you won't be able to bring them on board. Similarly, if they uh, want it and have, are capable of doing it, but they don't need it, it's not going to work. That's like me going to, like, you know, I guess, look at Oculus Rift things. I'm like, I, I really want this thing, and I'm capable of buying it, but I, just, I can't justify that I definitely need it right now. And lastly, if you need it, and you're capable of doing it, but you don't want it, it's a hard onboarding. This is like me going for a tooth extraction. Yes, I need it. Yes, I'm capable of booking one, but I don't fucking want to. You know? um, so <clears throat> the first wave of onboarding, this is like going back five years, was simply, let's point out the UI that we just built, because it's shit, and we need to explain it. And that was like onboarding 1.0. Onboarding 2.0 was like this LinkedIn style, let's give people progression meters so that they know how far they've, that they've gone. And this was like, you're 80% complete, add five more connections and whatever, and then you'll be 85% complete. Um, modern onboarding requires you to understand your user's definition of success and break down the barriers to get them there. I have to understand your user's definition of success and break down the barriers to get them there. This is why tips and tweaks won't get you there. You can't always optimize your way to better onboarding. Optimization can very quickly become this idea of like a black hole where you sink all your team's time and get literally very little in return. You need to know when to reset. So to give you an example of this, um, your product changes either a little or a lot, and your onboarding either works or it doesn't. And the way I think about it is, if your product hasn't changed a lot and your onboarding is good, that's a great time for optimization. If a lot has changed and it doesn't work, that's a great time for redesigning the whole thing. And in the other two cases, you could argue, well, if things have changed a lot and uh, you're working, you should probably go back and reimagine it anyway. And lastly, if, if your onboarding isn't working and then it's changed, you should probably fix it anyway. So there's only really one great case for optimization, which is that I think we're doing the right thing and we need to make it better. And I'll give you an example from Intercom of this. So 
For those of you who don't know, one of the things that you have to do at Intercom is you have to ask people to install JavaScript in your product. And by the way, if you think a credit card form is a big barrier, asking people to install JavaScript in a live product is a bigger one, right? Uh, so our definition of onboarding was we need to help people install the JavaScript correctly. And we've been working on this forever. Here's what it was in 2011. 2012, you can see we got more fancy. 2013, we got even more fancy. By the time 2014 had knocked around, we had it for engineers, business people, which language, watch a video, talk to us in our chat room. We had everything covered. We had optimized the shit out of this thing. And at the same time, in our product land, everyone was telling us, well, I actually just want to upload uh, users from a database. And so we built this upload users from a database or from a CSV tool. And we're like, OK, let's build that. And then, of course, the logic kicked in that, well, the product has changed now, so the onboarding should change. So we went from the saying onboarding is about how do we get people installing JavaScript to how do we get people getting their users into Intercom, which brought us here. We now offer this big, huge second option, which is get your users into Intercom from CSV. So simply doing that had a 40% kick in our conversion rate, which is huge. For any of you who think about your conversion rate and, and then basically multiply it by 1.4, that's a huge difference for the trajectory of your business. Huge. And most curiously, uh, what we found is it didn't cannibalize any of our existing stuff. This was net new customers. It wasn't like all of our old people were going through this route. It was a whole new type of people we were getting now. And what had happened was we'd gone from people who need it and want it but can't make progress, and we'd let them make progress. And now they need it, want it, and they can use it. And that was huge. But this only comes from a relentless focus on high-impact work on your onboarding. And just to explain that for a sec, work that you do, your growth team or your uh, onboarding team can do, can either be high-impact or low-impact. And it can either be a lot of work or a little work. Now, most people are good at staying out of the lower right. Most people stay away from like a lot, stuff that's a lot of work and does nothing. There's the top left here tends to be like quick wins, but there's very few of them. The top right is your strategy. And the hardest thing you'll ever do is get your team to stay way the hell out of the lower left, the shit that's easy but does nothing. And when it does nothing, you say, but it was easy. And because it's easy, you say, well, we don't expect it'll do much. And you have this circular logic, and you just spin your wheels, and you produce nothing. Only focus on high-impact work when you're tackling onboarding. There's so few occasions it makes sense to tweak. So to conclude, billion-dollar businesses of this generation will be built on great onboarding. It's not about everyone hearing about you. It's about everyone who does hear about you using you successfully. Great onboarding is built on an understanding of your customer's goals, an understanding, do they need it, do they want it, are they capable of progressing? Your onboarding has to improve every time your product improves. And don't snack. Don't focus on the low impact, low effort shit. Focus on impact. I hope this has been useful. I'm Des Trainer from Intercom. If you'd like the slides, it's just Des, that's slides at Intercom. Thank you. I need some traction. You need some traction.